This is the last presentation. It's on hydrology, on streams and groundwater. So we're really talking about water resources today. And so on the first page here, on the title page, you can actually see, I think it's called the Tan Tanforsen. It's a, a huge waterfall in mid-Sweden, close to the uh, Norwegian border, close to Åre, the town of Åre. It's a ski resort. It's up in the mountains. You wouldn't think that Sweden had mountains, but there are mountains in the in the corridor that lines the area between Norway and Sweden. Absolutely a spectacular place. Closer to home on the right-hand side, this photograph is taken of the Buffalo River in Arkansas, and it's looking off of a place called Big Bluff. So you're up about 300 feet over the Buffalo River looking down into this landscape. It's it's like the Midwest's uh, version of the Grand Canyon. Um, Big Bluff itself on which the goat trail, the goat trail runs across um, the middle of this, well, upper two thirds of that bluff. And it's about 550 feet high. It's a pretty big, pretty big bluff for uh, as standards go for Midwestern sort of like uh, things. Hydrology is a study of the, ge the combination between water and geology. So we're going to look at this in a lot of detail. 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, as you probably well know. It's mostly oceans, of course, though. And the rest, the 29%, that's the dry land, essentially. And it's not all dry, but some of it has lakes and rivers. And there are saltwater lakes, saline lakes as well. There's also some soil moisture in all of the land, in most of the land, I should say. <laughs> in some of the deserts, you have to go quite deep before you'd ever find any water. And then there's also water on Earth up in the atmosphere. And we talked about atmosphere last time when we talked about climate slightly. And so that comprises, all of that free surface water only comprises 0.2% of the water on Earth. So of the 2.8% that's left over from the volume of water, you know, 97.2% 90, of the volume of water on Earth is salt water from the oceans. The other 2.8%, you know, there's just a tiny bit that's free surface water. And so that makes it really important. Uh, anybody who's in uh, business knows, you know, or economics for that matter, knows that supply and demand, right? So that's what drives prices. And so we're, we're in the middle of, <laughs> in our generation now, we are commoditizing water. Many of you may have paid money for water. Um, I never paid money for water and until the 19, early 2000s, I think. I don't even know if I only paid for it then because I didn't trust <laughs> the, well, the, uh, the, the water fountains that were around. So water's been commoditized. They want you to buy water. In the past, water has always been sort of a free commodity. Every human being needs water. Our bodies are made out of water, mostly. Our blood, of course, 83%, the rest are the cells and all the red and white blood cells that are in our blood, bloodstream and the plasma and so forth. Our heart is almost 80%, 79.2%. So in other words, muscle is around 75%. Uh, and then the brain, everything's up around in the 70s or 80s, except for the bones. And the bones are only 22% water, but of course, that's just the bone marrow for the most part. And so as water bearing organisms, <laughs> we carry water from one place to another. And if we don't have enough water to drink in three days, maybe four days, we're done. You know, it's like you cannot get dehydrated. OK, on average, even in deserts, right, you need almost a gallon of water, maybe a little bit more than that in order to survive. In humid places like this, you need at least, you know, a, a gallon of water, too, to survive. Otherwise, your body begins to shut down and you have, begin to have organ failure. So water is that important to human beings and every other creature for that matter on this planet. Um, so we have this thing that we call a water cycle. So water will circulate through the atmosphere, into the streams, into the lakes, and eventually into the oceans. And so that's going to be the part that we talk about today. Some of it gets left in the in the rocks and the soil and so forth. And so we'll, we'll talk about all the various aspects. And then we'll talk about how that land is actually drained of its water as well. We'll, we'll investigate streams in some detail. 
But this is an image of what it's like to have the water cycle. If you want to be fancy about it, you can call it the hydrologic cycle. But really, it's a water cycle, really. If water condenses in the atmosphere to form clouds, those clouds may precipitate. That water falls to earth. Some of it soaks into the earth, and that's called infiltration. Some of it actually hits the surface, collects in pools or rivulets, and then begins to run off, and it flows into the nearest stream. And so when I, when I use the term stream, we're talking about everything that scales up from just a, uh, a small creek or a small, uh, tr you know, a very tiny little like uh, a flow of water all the way to the largest rivers. All of those are streams. OK, that's it's just it's one term that describes everything because you can't call a creek a river and you can't call a river a creek. Right. So they're both streams. And so uh, we get runoff and runoff as the component that we see in the streams. Evapotranspiration, that's how we complete the cycle, and that's through eva evaporation of the surface water, whether it's on land or whether it's in the ocean, and then also transpiration. So we combine those two words together. The transpiration part is where plants, in the process of converting carbon dioxide and water into sugars. Yeah, they, uh, they, they give off water at the same time, and so that's called transpiration. So evapotranspiration combines those two processes, regular natural evaporation and transpiration, the giving off of water by plants. This is going on simultaneously everywhere on the planet. If you've been paying attention just in the last couple of days here, we've got some major storms that have blown through. And it's a little bit chillier today. And it's, uh, you know, it's part of the weather, right? But weather influences the, the hydrological cycle as well. Of course, some of it becomes snow. Snow can become ice and so forth, right? And so ice ages we talked about just briefly here. This is another diagram that shows that same sort of cycle, but here they actually apply numbers to it, percentages, really. And so you can see what percentage each part of the hydrologic cycle compo uh, components are. The uh, the oceans are 96.5%, they say here, so 97.2. And the other uh, reading here, snowpack, 0 0.002%, 0002%. 0002%. And so... Um, you know that there's water residing, but it neither, okay, there's, there's a little tiny bit of water in the outer atmosphere that may get lost into space as we travel through space, but that's not a lot, okay? It has to go somewhere. Mars lost all of its water, but we have enough gravity on this planet to hold our water down and pull it into that lower level of the atmosphere. And because of that, we don't lose a lot to the outside, but we lose a tiny fraction of it. But at the same time, there's actually water locked in the earth inside of the mantle. <laughs> Crazy, right? But, but it comes out in spreading centers. So spreading centers actually release a tiny bit of water as well. It makes up for the water that we lose to the atmosphere. So it's the, uh, they call it juvenile water, actually, because it's water that hasn't been around and in this cycle forever. Well, it's in a longer frame sort of cycle with the, the very earliest formation of the earth. And then some of the subduction and everything can draw some water into the subsurface as well. So um, it's in a much longer time frame, I guess you could say. The rest of this water has been around forever. So when you drink water out of a tap, you know, that's probably gone through a dinosaur <laughs> or it may have gone through some birds or it may have gone through, you know, a whole bunch of other animals before you ever got to it. But, of course, it's cleaned of all the contaminants and everything. It's just H2O, right? That's all that water is. And you already know that water has this propensity for being a polarized molecule, a polar molecule, where the two hydrogens on one side give it a, a positive charge, and the oxygen is a negative charge, of course, and so there's a positive and negative side to water. And that's what makes it the the universal solvent, they say, so you can dissolve a lot of things in water, including sugars, right, and salt and things like that. And so that's what salt water is, right? So there's a bunch of ions that are released. You break the bonds, and those ions float around in water, and we call it salt water. So that is a snapshot of what it looks like in the hydrologic cycle for the amount of water that's in each component. Now, if we just look at the freshwater parts, there's a lot of it locked up in lakes. 
And there's just a handful of lakes that are just absolutely enormous. And in fact, 20% of the world's fresh water is in one lake. It's Lake Baikal in Russia, in the Siberian. It's right next to the Siberian platform. It's out in the middle of Russia in Siberia. And it's a, it's a lake that is a, over a mile deep. It's 5,700 feet deep. And I think there are like 57,000, now 5,700 square mile, cubic miles of water by volume in that lake. So it constitutes 20% of the world's fresh water. There are some other big lakes on this planet. Lake Tanganyika is 4,500 cubic miles of water. Lake Superior, the biggest lake in North America, not the deepest, but the biggest as far as area-wise. And um, Lake Superior is 2,800 cubic miles of water. And that doesn't even include Michigan, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie. So the North American Great Lakes, another source of an immense amount of fresh water and, and Lake Malawi also in Africa. So Tanganyika and Malawi in Africa, Superior in North America and Lake Baikal in Central Asia. So that is a huge source of fresh water. So there's even less fresh water than you might expect on this planet because these other ones are hard to get to, right? Well, where do we get our water from in Springfield? You're probably wondering that. I'll tell you, okay, but later, okay. So if we just go through uh, the the different processes, okay, just briefly, in fact, I don't want to belabor the point here because this is the last presentation. I don't want to spend hours doing it here, but at the same time, it's pretty important. You know that water exists in three states. It can either be ice, it could be liquid water, or it could be water vapor. And it takes energy to convert from one to the next, to the next. Okay, so it takes energy to convert to convert water to water vapor. It takes energy to convert ice to liquid water. Okay, so and it's roughly um, 80 calories. Okay, for that ice to water transition, but to go from liquid water to water vapor, that takes 600 calories of energy. Now, these calories that I'm talking about, it's a measure of how much energy it takes for one gram of water to increase one degree centigrade. That's the definition of a calorie. It's a measure of energy. So melting, of course, occurs at zero degrees centigrade. Vaporization, that is, you know, when things boil, right, so you get it up to the right temperature and it releases steam, that's at 100 degrees centigrade. So from ice to water phase, that's 80 calories. From, from water to the vapor phase, it's 600 calories. And um, to compare this with the kind of calories that you have in a nutritional diet, those are... I think it's equivalent to 1,000 small c calories is equal to one nutritional calorie. So we're talking about a lot of energy when we talk about calories, in other words. So it takes energy. You know, you have to melt ice, right? So that takes energy in order to melt it, right? Infrared radiation or whatever in order to get it to change into a different state. Uh, precipitation is pretty obvious, right? So you know all about snow, ice, rain, all the things that the Postal Service is supposed to make it through. And you know about infiltration already now. So that's where the water soaks into the ground when the ground is relatively dry and not saturated. If it's saturated, it has a difficult time soaking in because all of the pore spaces already contains, contains water. And so that water has a tendency to go into what we call runoff. And so runoff is where things collect into rivulets and things like that and eventually makes its way to a creek somewhere. So uh, evapotranspiration, I've already kind of talked about that, so I won't dwell on it anymore. But plants give off water, as does the process naturally from the wind blowing across the surface of a lake and the heat beating down on the surface of a lake in the summertime. That's going to evaporate, right? If you evaporate enough salt water, for instance, if you have a salt lake, you're going to make evaporite minerals, right? So, but it, remember, it takes energy to do that. There's a couple of other processes that are not so well known, but I'll just mention them to you here. Sometimes ice can go directly to a vapor phase. That's called sublimation. 
Um, if you've ever seen dry ice, uh, it's carbon dioxide ice, right? It gives off a sort of vapor. Well, that's a, a carbon dioxide vapor that it gives off. It's releasing carbon dioxide. With sublimation, what we're talking about with water is ice directly going into a vapor phase, and that can happen. And it still takes energy in order to convert ice into vapor then. Um, if it evaporates, sometimes if you're in the desert, and you're looking at rain clouds, and you can see the rain falling, but it never quite makes it to the surface. It may be a dry enough desert where the rain actually evaporates. I've seen it before where it makes it just a U-turn in the sky, and you can actually see the rain falling in the distance and then returning back up as water vapor. Uh, that's called virga. So Virga is a new word for you, perhaps. And so you can use it in uh, Scrabble if you're really, really into that sort of thing. Um, so uh, other processes, uh, we have an impact on water, of course. And so pollution is one of the things we have to worry about in civilization. Uh, water resources, freshwater resources are so precious that it behooves us to pay attention what goes into that water uh, so you don't throw things on the land you know, that you would be concerned about infiltrating into the groundwater. That's an issue. Um, other things, uh, even when we have rainstorms in like parking lots, right? So the rain hits that impervious or impermeable parking lot surface and it will drain off. And of course, it takes with it all of the materials that cars have leaked onto that surface and all of the, you know, sodas that were dumped out there and the coffee and the dogs that were walked by there. And so there is pollution, okay, at the Earth's surface. And so we like to protect our aquifers that way. I'll define what an aquifer is here in a bit. Um, so larger populations, we have to be careful about how we dispose of water. So for instance, uh, in Springfield, where does our water come from? It comes from Fellows Lake, mostly. So Fellows Lake is a freshwater lake. They barely allow any sort of boats in it at all. I think it's 25 horses or less. And so you also have to have, I mean, they won't let you swim in it even, okay? That's how much they want to protect this. They take the water from Fellows Lake and they pipe it to areas, well, they pipe it in the north side up to the Fulbright Pump Station. Fulbright Pump Station is the northern facility that makes good water for Springfield. It's good tasting water for that matter as well. On the east side of Springfield is another water filtration plant or water treatment plant, and that is they take water out of the James River as well. So the two-thirds that are on the south side of Springfield, get their water out of the James River. The people on the north side get their water out of Fellows Lake or McDaniel Lake because McDaniel is the next lake along the line. And uh, part of the water also is pumped from Fulbright Spring, which happens to be at the Fulbright Treatment uh, Center as well. So up in that vicinity, I think there are about four 8 million gallon tanks that they treat on a daily basis. So about 32 million gallons there. And I think it's almost double that when you get to Blackman Water Treatment Facility. So there's a lot of water that gets used in the Springfield area. We are in a fortunate situation. Most of our water is fairly, fairly clean here. And we are in an area that is on a divide. So the surface water here is relatively fresh. And even the subsurface water is relatively fresh. And um, in fact, it's all fresh. We have to watch it for pollution, of course, as well. Uh, but when it's pumped out of the ground, um, it comes out of aquifers in the subsurface as well. So that's where our water comes from. It comes from Fellows Lake and it comes from the James River. If we are ever in a drought and we've made provisions for being in the city of Springfield, uh, City Utilities operates our water system here. And uh, in... In the Fulbright pump station, they have the capacity to flip on switches that will drain water out of Stockton Reservoir as well. So we can actually tap into Stockton Reservoir a little bit farther to the north of Springfield here, maybe 25 miles. And there's pipelines that draw that, bring that water to Springfield then. So that's kind of our water system here. How do they treat it? Well, they... They mix it with charcoal. They mix it with some flocculants. They try to get the algae out of it. They treat it with potassium permanganate, which kills any sort of biological organisms. They actually uh, give a little bit of, uh, I think it's chlorine actually, but it, chlorine's another agent that will stop, you know, mostly in the 
in the summertime that they use it, but it's an alga, algicide, if you will. So they want to keep all of the microbes, the, the amoebas and paramecium and all, all that sort of things. Anything that can make you sick, in other words, you want to, you want to make sure that it's free from cholera and all of these other things that can actually lead to an ep epidemic. You may have heard of cities before that have what they call boil orders. You have to boil your water before you can drink it. As far as I recall, I think there were maybe there was maybe one episode of a boil order in one certain part of town, uh, and that was a long time ago. I'm talking almost 50 years ago, I would say. Um, so that's where our water comes from. You also have to treat it after it's been used, of course. And so we have two plants to do that sort of treatment as well, although in the Ozarks, there are a fair number of what we call septic systems that treat waste water. What kind of waste water? Well, we're talking about every time you flush the toilet. Where does it go? Well, it goes into a sewer system. Where does that sewer system go? Well, it right now goes into a facility that's stationed over the top of Jordan Creek in the southwest part of the city. Uh, the city, if you're on the north side, it goes up to the Sauk River, Dry Sauk River. And... Um, they treat it there. They they pull out the solids. They they let those they, they remediate the solids, spreading them out across the field to let them dry out and become not toxic. Uh, it's treated with oxygen. It's treated with a few other chemicals, and then the the clean water at the end of that treatment gets returned into the system, and so it's released into once it meets the proper standards, it's released into the rivers around it. So the water on the south side is released from the into Wilson's Creek essentially so Wilson's Creek actually gets a charge of water from the water treatment facility and if you ever hike on the trails the the Wilson's Creek trail you'll smell the oxygenation that's in there so it smells a little bit like bleach as you walk by it on the north side I've never been around that treatment facility much but it's uh I assume it's about the same sort of condition when the water is released um so what happens to it after that? What's the story of water after that? Well, if you're on the north side of Springfield, the Sauk River drains to the north. And when it drains to the north, it actually gets impounded at Stockton Reservoir. So it makes a round trip if we ever have to use Stockton Reservoir. Of course, it's been diluted, of course, as well. And so if it's released from Stockton Reservoir, which it is for the production of energy, uh, hydroelectric energy, it makes its way down to the Osage River. Now, the Osage River actually flows out of eastern Kansas. The Meridisane and the, I think it's the Grand River of the South come together and it makes the Osage River. And so the Osage River starts a little bit west of Osceola and then it, then it continues to flow eastward and it's dammed up yet again in Truman Reservoir. The dam for that is around Warsaw, Missouri. And then it continues downstream even farther into Lake of the Ozarks. So Lake of the Ozarks, if you're a local around here, you're familiar with what goes on there. And so Lake of the Ozarks, another impoundment, eventually releases the water back into for energy use. It's owned by Ameren. And so that company generates electricity out of it and gets, sends it to Kansas City, excuse me, to St. Louis. And then uh, the water is released and it makes its way into the Missouri River. So the Missouri River then flows and eventually runs into the Mississippi River, just a little bit north of St. Louis, in fact. Those two giant rivers that cross the, the mid-continent region combine and come together just a little bit north of St. Louis, and then they begin to flow south, of course. On the south side of Springfield, the water gets into Wilson's Creek. Most of it does. Some of it heads east and heads out towards the, the James River there, but the James flows around the south side of Springfield, and then Wilson Creek runs into the James, and so they come back together in the James River. And so James River flows to the south. It combines eventually with Finley Creek, which runs through places like Ozark. It runs through places like Nixa. And that water collects and then runs on down to Table Rock Lake. And so Table Rock Lake is an impoundment that includes the King River, all the water that comes out of Beaver Reservoir in Arkansas, and it's, it becomes part of the White River system then. So the White River system 
runs and gets dammed up every so often. So Table Rock Dam, and then below that you get Power Site Dam, and it dams up an impoundment known as Lake Taney Como. Below Lake Taney Como, in the tail race there, you actually get into Bull Shoals Lake. And so Bull Shoals Lake flows in and becomes the White River after that. The Buffalo River flows into the White River, and together they flow on out into the Mississippi River eventually. It never quite gets to the Arkansas River. So the Arkansas River is just about a mile south of where the White River flows in to the Mississippi. But it's an interesting concept because on the north side of Springfield, it goes north. On the south side of Springfield, it goes south. And eventually they both come back together where the White River and the Mississippi come together. And the, and the water that was on that divide, that maybe some of it flows this way and some of it flows this way, in a rainstorm, it's going to come back together eventually in Arkansas, on the east side of Arkansas. Where the, where the White River converges or has a confluence with the Mississippi River. That's a long explanation, but that's where our water comes from and where it goes So after it's treated. So once it's in these rivers, what happens to it? Well, the communities downstream use it for a water source. So the lakes may be used as a water source as well. Okay, so even after all of that, and let's say you're still on the Mississippi River and the water keeps flowing south and you get all the way down to New Orleans, right? So New Orleans is about 100 miles upstream from the delta, from the end of the delta at the Mississippi River. Where do, what do they do with the water down? Well, they drink it, okay? They have to treat it and they drink it. So the estimate is, okay, hold, okay, you can go, you know, put fingers on your ears and go, la, 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 you don't want to hear this, but the estimate is that when a, a bit of water that you get out of a tap in New Orleans and you drink that tap water, it's already been through 17 people. That's why we like to have clean water that we discard, and that's why we like to drink clean water right? Because, well, it's, you know, there are fish that swim in it, right? So, you know, it's like one of the things that you may hear, it is dilution is the solution, okay? So if there are contaminants, you know, if you dilute it enough, it's not really all that contaminated. But if your reservoir is not very big, it can get contaminated pretty easily. So you have to be careful. So they test it all the time, right? That's part of what government is all about. You know, a lot of people decry, is like, why do we need this, you know, government? That's, it's because they keep us all safe. They test things. They make sure that we're all healthy. Okay, it's, you know, I wish the government had been more in charge of this pandemic, okay? But, you know, local governments actually did pretty well. And some of the federal government even did well, okay? Mm, okay, that's all I need to say about that. But, in fact... We know that water is very precious on this planet. Otherwise, we could be, we could wind up looking like Mars if we don't take care of our planet. We don't want to do that. Population increases. You know that there are rising standards of, of living. You know that people dispose of all sorts of things down the toilet. And so it's it's very important to be careful. People want to have these beautiful green lawns and everything, right? So they fertilize the heck out. Where does the fertilizer go? Well, it goes into the water. What does it do in the water? It causes algae to bloom. Well, what's the big deal about that? Well, it turns the water green first. And then those algae that live, they die. And when they die, they eventually are going to suck the oxygen out of that water. That's just one of the things that happens when you over-nutrify water that algae will come along and have a giant bloom and it takes all the oxygen out of that water and you get fish kills. And so fish die from that. And so if you put too much fertilizer in it, you don't want to put herbicides in there either. Herbicides have a tendency to kill things, not only weeds, but aquatic animals as well. So it's very important to look at the sort of chemicals that get disposed of. Springfield's got a, a history and a problem with that sort of disposal. Around the Springfield area, a lot of people think that there's a sinkhole. I'm going to throw the old refrigerator in there, or I'm going to throw my old used motor oil in there, or something even worse, okay? And that has happened in Springfield a lot, okay? You know, we're a part of the Ozarks, and part of the history of the Ozarks is that we are a very independent people. We are people that came in from Appalachia. We are people that came in from Tennessee, Virginia, 
from Kentucky, from Indiana, from Illinois, from all these various places. And as people pushed west, these were the pioneers that settled this land. And many of us are the descendants of those people. They are kind of backward people in many ways because they were self-reliant. But at the same time, now we have uh, we have to become reliant on each other to do the right thing. And that's not always the case in the Ozarks. You know, in the old days, in the 1950s and 1960s, they talked about hillbillies. That hillbilly mentality is still up here. There's a recent book called Hillbilly Elegy. Um, I don't know. I don't recommend it highly. But, you know, at the same time, it's like there's a lot of that going on in the Ozarks. So you have to get your mind into the mindset that you no longer are a, are a an individual, a rugged individual, in this American, you know, you know, not all of you are American. I realize that, you know, but among, I'm talking to you Americans, you have to realize that you're in a community and we all have to rely on one another, I guess is what I would say, especially when it comes to things like water. So with that, um, we want to have potable water and potable water means that we can cook with it and we can drink it potable. It looks like potable, but it's potable. Okay. Drinkable water. And so that's our goal in, you know, for a, a municipality like the city of Springfield. There's 160,000 people that live here and a quarter of a million people that live in the area, maybe 300,000 now with the late, latest census records here. But large cities have this tendency to sprawl. We have a, a tendency to put impervious uh, pavements across the landscape and we get a lot more runoff because of that. And so our streams tend to be very flashy. They say we get a lot of flash floods. So because of that increased runoff and everything, there's a lot of pollutants that go into the local streams in order to protect that water. The municipality here says, if you have a certain area that's going to have an impermeable surface, you need to have a detention basin that will catch that water and allow it to percolate and infiltrate into the groundwater. We have to always think about letting the water back into the infiltration system because otherwise it's just going to go on down the river and make its way on out to the sea and not be usable anymore. So uh, we worry about our watersheds. We worry about our groundwater here. Um, so Next on the agenda here, <laughs> okay, if I've gotten off of my soapbox now about keeping fresh water and keeping clean, safe drinking water, let me go on to the next step, and that's to talk about streams. We're going to talk about that runoff now. There are two different kinds of streams. If you look on geologic, if you look on topographic maps, it shows these in great detail. There are intermittent streams and perennial streams. Intermittent means it only runs part of the time. And perennial means that it runs all of the time. There's always going to be some water in that stream. So, for instance, the James River is regarded as a perennial stream. Many of the creeks around here, even Jordan Creek, right, that runs through the middle of Springfield, is an intermittent stream. It only occasionally, when it after rainstorms and things like that, that it has a lot of water in it. When you're in an area that is in the uplands or the highlands like we are right here in Springfield. We rest on a plateau here. It's a relatively flat area. And we're in between two river systems. So we're in between the Sauk and the James over here. That's called an interfluve. It means it's in, in between two rivers, interfluve. And so we are in at what we regard as a headwaters region. We are an area where streams first get established and then they become larger streams as they radiate away from the Springfield Plateau. So I very commonly, I'm going to go to a series of hand-drawn sketches, okay? I learned a new program just in order to be able to show you this because there are many, many photographs I love to show you, but I can't put them into a video because that's a copyright infringement. So I hand-drew many of these things that are coming up here, but we're going to talk about headwaters. We're going to talk about mature streams. We're going to talk about meanders, valleys, floodplains, how floodplains get established. We're going to talk about some old age streams. And then we're also going to talk about the coastal plains and the deltas here. So that's next on the, the list here. So this is the sort of diagram I was telling you about. Intermittent streams on this on this map view of a, of a watershed. Now a watershed is an area where water collects 
on the surface of the earth. You can show it in map view and you can draw an area around it where all of the water would collect into one stream drainage. And that's called a divide or an interfluve. Interfluve is the term we use when it's relatively flat, like around Springfield. But a divide could be like a ridge. If you're on a ridge and you're the very top of the ridge, water's going to be off to one side, water will be off to the other side. That's a divide. And so here you can see the intermittent streams are indicated by that dash and then three dots, dash, three dots, dash, three dots. Those are all intermittent streams. So in other words, if you were to see one of those on a topographic map, you would know that there's a high likelihood that there's not going to be any water in it except during flash floods. Now, if you have enough of these streams that come together, they become perennial after a while. So all of these things are regarded as tributary streams that eventually will run into what we call a trunk stream. So if you kind of squint and look at this sort of like diagram from a distance here, you can actually see that it looks like a tree. Now that's called a dendritic drainage pattern. So dendritic means that it's tree-like or tree-shaped. And so you can see all the trunk streams coming together here. And that's kind of like where they all collect down here at the, the bottom right hand side. And you can see where there's a couple of streams even that, that define that divide on the other side that are flowing to the north there, north of the divide there, a couple of intermittent streams. So tributaries are the streams that come together to form trunk streams. So there's some funny games that people who study rivers uh, do so they would call each one of these a first order stream that's up next to the divide and where two first order streams come together that makes a second order stream and so they get larger and larger a third order stream would be where two second order streams come together to form a third order stream and so you know it's just something that scientists it's one of the games that we play about how rivers are organized if you will but that is a, a dendritic drainage pattern right here and you can see where those streams drain together from tributaries into a trunk stream here now as we go farther on if we were to go and walk down one of those stream courses, one of those intermittent streams, eventually to where it became a perennial stream and you put your kayak in there and you floated downstream, if you took that distance, that's called the downstream distance. So you could follow that trunk stream around all the curves and everything like that. And eventually you're going to get to a place that's pretty flat. And where the, where the river begins to flatten out, and eventually you're going to get down in the Mississippi River. You're going to keep going. You're going to be in the Delta eventually, right? Well, what's it like down there? So that river actually is a little tiny bit below sea level, in fact. The Mississippi River, at the very bottom of it, is going to be a little bit below. Of course, they have to dredge it out down there. But it's pretty close to sea level. And so what I've shown you in this diagram is what we call the ideal stream profile. This is a concept that we use in order to communicate some of the fundamental aspects of streams and, and how they operate. So there's a couple of things that I need to define for you. On the left-hand side, that's the elevation. On the, on the bottom side of this, that's called the downstream distance. So that's where you're in the kayak and following the trace of that river downstream. It's a distance, isn't it? It's a distance. And the elevation, you can take that off of a map, right? And so you know that things, water generally flows downhill, right? And as it flows downhill, it's usually going to have a steeper gradient in the headward regions or in the upper part of that stream. We're going to call it the headwaters. We're also going to refer to it as a youthful stream up in that sort of area. So up close to the divide, in other words, gradient is defined as the elevation change in feet or meters over the downstream distance in miles or kilometers or you know feet or whatever you want to use whatever terms you want to use but it's the elevation change over the downstream distance that's called gradient uh, usually when we talk about canoeing people talk about feet per mile so for instance a good canoeing stream is about eight feet per mile that's how much the water drops it's you know from elevation gain right so the surface of the water has dropped eight feet in that mile of downstream distance. Um, when you're in the upper regions up there, it's not uncommon to have like 10, 15, 20 feet per mile dropping, and then even more than that, perhaps even some mountainous areas. So that's the ideal stream profile. You will see in the headwater region, there's a high gradient there. You get a lot of elevation drop for a short distance. 
And as you keep going farther and farther downstream, the gradient te- tends to decrease. It tends to decrease as you, when you finally get out there to the delta, your gradient, you're lucky if you have one foot of gradient, okay, one foot drop over a mile. I'm pretty sure that the Mississippi is just a few inches, in fact, every every mile that you would go downstream. So, for instance, you know that New Orleans is pretty close to sea level, right? Except in the Crescent area. And so if you're to go downstream from there, you're maybe dropping just a few inches. So the gradient is very, very gentle, very, very low when you're in the lower, the outer reaches of a stream. And so the, the downstream area, so in the deltas, in the well, we refer to it actually as an old age river. So if we use youthful for the headwaters, in the middle part we call it mature, and in the in the very the very most downstream parts of a stream we call that the old age region. And so that's where things behave differently, and it's a low gradient. That's one of the characteristics you see down there. So I've tried to indicate these on here. So here's the ideal stream profile in the blue line that's traced across there. In distance, of course, is would be segmented across there. So here's one mile, two mile, three mile, so forth. So it's not the actual length of that line. It's the distance along that axis. And elevation, same thing. So elevation is the, you know, all along that axis there. It's on the left-hand side. So that is one example of an ideal stream profile. I've drawn you another one over here. This was with Adobe Illustrator a few years ago. I drew this. And I actually show what it means to have an area that has a temporary base level that's a little bit different from the ultimate base level. And generally, most rivers want to get down to sea level. That's the base level, we call it. That's the lowest of which a stream will actually erode. That's what base level means. It's the lowest elevation to which a stream will actually erode, base level. So you can actually have local or temporary base levels as well. So here you can see there's a temporary impoundment, and it may in fact cut through that area. So, um, you know, if you interfere with stream flow, you're going to affect the characteristics, the erosion and the deposition of that stream. So here I show you that ultimate elevation is just below sea level, in fact, here. And the highest elevation on that stream is going to be up here on the upper left-hand side. Um, So what happens in that upper regions up here where we have the headwaters, where it's a youthful stream? You have three types of erosion. Erosion is one of the most common characteristics. If you have that sort of gradient, you're also going to have a lot of energy in that stream. That energy is going to downcut. It's also going to cause that valley to try to widen its profile. It's also going to cause that river to try to cut backwards and cut into the divide that's behind it. It wants to cut into that ridge if it can. And so that's what happens in a headwater sort of stream systems here. It, It has erosion going on in three dimensions. Down cutting, valley widening, and headward erosion. Three dimensions. <laughs> Down cutting is the vertical one. Valley widening is the horizontal one. And headward erosion is trying to lengthen its distance, okay? Trying to make its long distance, its, its downstream distance, a little bit longer here. So that. Yeah, I'm going to try to rush up a little bit here. I've got the same sort of like areas mapped out on this ideal stream profile here. And you already know that the discharge, well, okay, the gradient is going to be highest in the headwaters region. That's the youthful stream over here on the left-hand side. The intermediate, uh, the mature stream is in the middle part in here. And that's where you have a a stream that in fact has a lower gradient and the lowest gradient of all is going to be the old age stream out there. I've shown you that on the last slide. Now we're going to talk about a different concept now. We're going to talk about discharge. Discharge is the amount of water that flows past a given point over a given period of time. So we measure that. In fact, you can do it by hand. You can do it by calculation. You can go out and actually measure a stream and and see how fast it's flowing, for instance. A ping pong ball is enough to be able to do that and the ruler and you can go and measure the water depth across that. You can map out where the wetted perimeter of that stream is and you can calculate the volume that then flows past that given point. 
that's the old way of doing it, right? Today they use impellers and like uh, current meters. And with a stick and a probe, you can actually stand in the river. And I'll show you an example of that in a second here. But people do that. And so they collect data. And much of it's actually automated these days. And so there are actually stations set up by the U.S. Geological Survey to monitor the water in many of the streams across the country. And so there's thousands of stream gauging stations across the country that keep the fingers on the pulse of this country, right, to find out if we are, are we in a drought in this area? Are we in a, you know, oversaturated? Are we flood risks? Or, you know, it's, it's an important sort of investment that our government makes in order to understand water on our in our nation. So if we talk about discharge, that's a volume of water. You can measure it in cubic feet per second. You can measure it in millions of gallons a day. That's what they use, for instance, in, in springs, right? So springs have this massive flow of water that pours out of a, a let's say, a subsurface cave, right? So it just flows out of that. And so you can measure it in millions of gallons a, a day or gallons a day. You can also do it in the metric system, which is cubic meters per day. Uh, so our cubic meters per second. So there's a lot of different things. So you just essentially have some sort of volume over time, right? So that's what discharge is. So discharge tends to be very variable when you're in the headwater region because, well, that's mostly intermittent streams, right? And so they're not going to be flowing until the, until it rains or if it snows and it begins to melt, right? That's the sort of variable flow that you would expect to get out of a headwater or a youthful stream. And in fact, they tend to have a lot of flash floods. And so, and that's one of the issues we have in the Springfield area. We have a lot of flash floods in this area. You'll hear flash flood warnings all the time. Every time you hear about a severe thunderstorm, if it rains for two or three days, then they come up with the flash flood warning for this county or that county. So variable discharge, but usually it's fairly low discharge, right, during a regular non-rain event. So they tend to be smaller streams and they gather together from tri tributaries to make larger streams. As they collect, of course, they're going to flow eventually and become a mature stream. In a mature stream, you get intermediate sort of... Uh, a discharge. Uh, so you're getting more discharge, but like, for instance, the James River doesn't have near the discharge that you would get in the White River. OK, so the White River is much, much larger in scale. And so the amount of water that flows into the Mississippi from the White River, much greater than what the James flows into Table Rock Lake. Um, when you finally get down to these old age streams, we call them old age streams because they've expent most of their energy already and they have really wide floodplains. Now streams actually begin to meander and form floodplains as mature streams, but by the time they become old age streams, those floodplains tend to be really wide. And so you can have large scale floods, not flash floods so much, but large scale seasonal floods in places that are old age streams. And eventually, of course, it's going to reach the sea. And that's where you're going to take and deposit most of the sediment that that river is carrying. And so that's kind of the, the story of how you have discharge with this ideal stream profile. You already know about gradient with the ideal stream profile. So what are the dominant processes that are going on? Well, you know that high energy is kinetic energy, really, that you generate from having a, a high gradient. And flashy gives you a large slug of water, and you have erosion being the dominant sort of function then with youthful streams. And I've already talked about the three types of erosion that you get in a youthful stream. This sounds like a test question, doesn't it? In youthful streams, you have downcutting, valley widening, and and you try to lengthen the stream by headward erosion. So headward erosion, downcutting, and valley widening are the three erosional processes that operate in a youthful stream. By the time you get into a mature stream, that river begins to run back and forth, and it does what we call meandering. It's the sort of thing that an old man does in a store, right? Instead of being bored, we don't look at things, right? So you wander around from place to place. That's what meandering is. It wanders, essentially. And as it turns out, it also becomes a place where uh, erosion and deposition become more in balance there. So all of the sediment that you're carrying along with that stream gets deposited, and then it gets eroded in other places in a mature stream. And finally, when you get to an old age stream, it's a very low energy sort of setting, and deposition then becomes the dominant factor in an old age stream. 
So as we go farther here, um, these are just repeating some of the things I've just said. Headwater streams, headward erosion, downcutting, valley widening, gradients pretty high, the, the volume, the discharge is, tends to be very variable. Uh, by the way, streams tend to have this sort of V-shape uh, in their headwater regions. If it were U-shaped, you probably should associate that with glaciers, so that's more like uh, Yosemite and places like that. But V-shaped streams, and of course you're going to get waterfalls and rapids in these sort of headwater regions like that. Um, the discharge is the amount of water. It just gives you some of these things these same sort of parameters that we just talked about here. Some of the things that we didn't talk about, however, there's a couple different kinds of water flow that you can get in streams. One of those is turbulent flow. So if you have a lot of boulders and things like that where the water rushes and hits that boulder and then bounces around and splashes and you get rapids and things like that, that's that's pretty much the definition of what turbulent flow is. If you were to trace the path of any particle of water, it would be absolutely chaotic. You know, it's going downstream and going this way and that. The opposite of that, in fact, is where things become more stable, maybe a little bit less energy sometimes, and you get what they call laminar flow. So laminar flow is where they tend to, to go parallel with one another in the water column. And that happens more when you get into mature streams. And so mature streams and old age streams tend to have more laminar flow. There's some turbulence, but not so much, unless you're in flood conditions. And so turbulent flow is effective, in fact, in, at moving boulders and cobbles and sand and other particles. And so that's why erosion is such an important factor. Not only is there a lot of kinetic energy for the water, the turbulent flow can carry those particles away and deposit them farther downstream. Here's an image right here of a headwater stream in the Appalachian Mountains. And so this is a place where you get variable flow. It's a little waterfall up there, so you can see that, you know, this thing hasn't cut down to as deeply into the stream as it locally could, right? So eventually that's going to erode deeper and deeper into that gully. And you can see some of the boulders and cobbles and so forth. It's a good indication that this is actually a headwater stream here. On the next slide, it shows you what a current meter looks like and actually somebody from the USGS who's out collecting current data in a stream by you know, putting the waders on and wading out into the stream and then measuring the flow velocity. And so they do that by stepping out and measuring the distance across and so forth so you can get at the discharge that way. So discharge the amount of flow at a certain point over a given period of time. So useful streams and sedimentation, you know, useful streams often flow in the mountains. And at, you already know this, in fact, that all of that material may wind up in an alluvial fan. That's one of the very common ways that they deposit materials into an area that may be a temporary base level, let's say. So, for instance, in Death Valley, when the water flows out, forms an alluvial fan there, you're going to pile up the sediment there. Yeah, what's the likelihood? Well, there's no rivers that flow through Death Valley. So that's as far as that alluvial fan is ever going to go. And it's below sea level, right? So it's never going to make its way out of that valley. It's going to have to evaporate, in other words. But that's alluvial fans. We talked about alluvial fans when we talked about sedimentation. One of the things we didn't talk about, however, was braided streams. In some mountainous areas, for instance, in Alaska especially, there's a lot of gravel that winds up in the big trunk streams there. So the tributaries come in and they deliver a lot of gravel, especially after the snow melts in the springtime, right? In the summertime, the rivers really get flushing with a lot of, of water. And in fact, that's the story of uh, Into the Wild, I think it was. It was a, a book written by uh, Krakauer. And so John Krakauer wrote a book called Into the Wild. It was about a student, uh, roughly your age, who was from Emory University, and he decided he wanted to live on the, you know, into the wild. And he was in Alaska, and he got cut off from civiliz civilization by a braided stream like this. The flow was just too great for him to get across what he felt like he could do safely. And so braided streams are are streams that tend to be choked with sediment at certain times. And then when the high flow comes in the middle of summer, let's say during the, the high melt season, 
that's uh, when you're not going to be able to make it across that stream. So uh, just a couple of photos to show you here, here uh, three photos to show you here. Here's a, uh, an example of an alluvial fan here. So that's in Death Valley. And of course, the water that flows out of that canyon deposits those rocks out there, sometimes in debris flows and things like that. But commonly, even rainfall events will have water flush across that surface. That is a, an alluvial fan. In this slide, you can actually see what it looks like to be a braided stream. And you can see there are multiple channels that they call it anastomosing. And so anastomosing means that it goes in several channels, but they all come back together at some point usually. And so that's a braided stream in Alaska. And in fact, if we wanted a close up on that here, you can see one that is predominantly out of sand in this case, but uh, very commonly they have a lot of gravel in them as well. So braided streams, very common in mountainous areas. And what a braided stream really tells you is that is a stream that is overloaded with sediment. And so as the mountains rise up, they are being eroded and that erosional material gets carried away in these rivers. And so braided streams tend to carry a lot of gravel and sand in them. Um, if we go on, youthful streams have become mature streams. We're going to leave the mountains. Well, we're mostly leave the mountains, not completely. So they leave the mountainous areas and they lose their energy, right? So the energy that gets expel, <laughs> expended by moving particles around and things like that and all that high energy that of waterfalls and rapids and things like that, by the time it becomes a mature stream, all of that activity is pretty much gone. There may be a few riffles and things like that, but not real common. So not all streams have a lot of sediment in them. The sediment, in fact, typically goes into the mature streams. And so in the mature streams in the Ozarks here, we have a lot of gravel. Okay, that's the most common sort of grain size that's carried by the streams around here. Uh, most of the carbonates actually go into solution, so it's, it's not an issue. You're not going to carry a lot of limestone cobbles and things like that in the stream around here. Um, Flowing water in, in perennial streams still has a lot of energy, however, and the way that they dissipate that energy is when they get large enough and the volume of water is enough, the discharge, that they tend to go from side to side and do this meandering. And when they do that, they actually cut into the surface of the land and they form what we call a floodplain. So floodplains commonly form in mature streams. And so as they meander from place to place, that cuts this floodplain, and then they begin to then make bends. And so the meander bends are part of this function as well. Um, as, here's an example. Okay, so this is a, a, a braided, this is not a braided, this is a meandering stream in a mountain valley. And you can see all the curves. So those are meander bends, in fact, in that stream. Now this, I think that's the Reese River, and that's in Nevada. So Nevada, as you know, is a very mountainous state, and so there's all these alluvial fans that dump out into this valley, but there's enough perennial water flowing through the Reese River. Now, you could jump across the Reese River. It's like three feet across, but it still has a relatively flat landscape that it travels across on that stream, in that valley floor, and it begins to then, you know, meander. And so that's some meandering that it's doing in this, in this situation. Um, that's just because you can actually show it in one photograph that way. That's kind of cool that way. Um, but meandering streams tend to have some features that youthful streams don't have. And one of those is they tend to flood. If you have a floodplain and you have a large volume of water coming out, a lot of the sediment will actually pile up on the sides of the channel. And those are called natural levees. So there's a tendency to form high spots right next to the stream channel when you get into mature streams. And so natural levees are one of those functions. The channel itself is going to be in the central part where most of the water flows. But during floods, of course, it's going to spill out into and over those natural levees into the rest of the floodplain. Then I have some diagrams to show you here in a second. Two of the key features of a mature stream are that we get cut banks and we also get point bars. And so here is an example in this I show you three cross sections of a mature stream here, and you can see the water flowing in a channel at the bottom of that floodplain. And you can see that probably has cut back and forth across that floodplain in order to form that relatively flat surface. If I could draw better, I would have made it flat across there. But the green line shows you the land surface there, essentially. And so there's a valley wall on one side and a valley wall on the other side. That defines the floodplain. And the channel flows somewhere in between, right? But it's going to meander from one side to the other side through time. 
So it takes a lot of time sometimes to meander that sort of distance, but oftentimes if you're if you're really looking for it, you can actually find the old channels that have flown across that valley. And so um, during flood stage in a mature stream like this, and that's the dirty water flowing in the middle cross section here, that flood stage has a slug of water flowing through the channel that is the highest vo velocity and the highest volume right there, but there's dirty water that flows onto the sides. And that's one of the reasons why streams have very, very fertile land because the sediment gets into those sort of overbank deposits, they call them. So over the top of the natural levee on the sides over there, you deposit sediment. I show you what the natural levees actually, how they build up on the sides of that channel here on the very bottom cross section here. So those are the natural levees made out of sand. Oftentimes you can breach those things, in fact, when during a flood, but they tend to heal up pretty, pretty rapidly as well. So that's what a cross-section of a mature stream looks like. Here's a map view looking down on a mature stream now, and you can see how those meanders have actually cut the valley that it flows within. And so the, the channel itself is outlined by the blue line here, and the meanders are shown as these loops and loop-de-loops and so forth, and it's flowing from the top to the bottom down here. I put an arrow at the bottom to indicate that. Oftentimes, because of the energy that that is expending, when the water makes that loop, it's actually expending energy and it actually folds in on itself, sort of. I've got another diagram to show you that, the next diagram, in fact. And it has what they call helical flow. There's a tendency to cut the banks. And so they tend to be very steep banks on the outsides of those meander bends. And on the inside of the meander bend, it tends to be fairly shallow angle. So the outside's called the cutback, and the inside's called the point bar. So each one of those meander bends has that as a characteristic. And sometimes when you have enough energy, you can actually break through the necks that are built up by this meandering process. And if you break through, we call that a cutoff. So the cutoff can come off and take a shortcut by having a cut bank that actually collapses on one side and maybe cuts through the other side, maybe during a flood. And you leave behind a bend of, of that river. And of course, if there's no longer water flowing through it, eventually it's going to plug up with sediment at the ends. They call those things oxbow lakes, in fact, because it has that sort of U shape like this, right? So it's an oxbow lake like this. And so that's what they, they used to use oxen to plow and, and so forth. And they would put a yoke and then the oxbow would be underneath of the neck of that ox. And so here you can see that oxbow lake here. Is another one down at the bottom down here, and you can see a second cutoff there as well. So when we look at a cross-section of a channel, you can actually see that over here on the lower right-hand side. You can see where the erosion occurs on the outside, and you can see on the point bar side, that's where mostly deposition occurs. It's a lower velocity there. As it turns out, where the water's deepest tends to be where the highest velocity is as well. And so, and in fact, if you look at the channel that has the aqua blue filling in it right there, that's the cross section. It shows you the natural levee that's on the outside of that cut bank there at the top surface. So when the water floods over, that's when that's deposited. But otherwise, you're going to erode that bank over here, and that's going to be material that will collapse into the river and then be carried as sediment farther downstream. But the sediment gets deposited on the inner low velocity zone of that stream profile. Very commonly, they have that sort of airfoil sort of shape. Now, there's a couple of terms for you. These are new terms for you. The word is thalweg. If you look at the deepest part of a channel, that's called the thalweg. T-H-A-L. W-E-G. I think it's German. I don't know what it means exactly, but we need to find it as the deepest part of a stream. And we can actually estimate the stream velocity. Uh, well, you can esti actually estimate the velocity from the thalweg. Okay, so what they do is they use what they call the six-tenths rule. And what it means is if you find the thalweg or the deepest part of that channel, if you go six tenths of the way to the bottom, that is where the highest velocity, the average velocity is. The highest velocity is actually above that in a slug of water that is just below the surface. At the very surface, you actually get a little bit of friction with the air. 
But just below the surface, there's laminar flow and there's a slug of water that will flow through there. Now, the six-tenth rule gives us an opportunity to then practice and figure out exactly what the velocity of that water is. And you're going to have low velocity on the inside on the point bar, high velocity on the outside at the cut bank, and that's pretty much the dynamics of a stream channel right there. With one more addition, if you look just into the upper left of that cross section, you can actually see the point bar and cut back again. And it shows you that thou leg in there, but in the thou leg, there's actually a tendency for, for the water to actually spiral as it goes downstream. Now this is interesting and it's pretty important actually for many of you. Um, many of you are from Missouri and many of you hear about people drowning in some of the big rivers around the Ozarks. Maybe you've heard about people drowning in the Cascanade River. It's a very common occurrence, in fact, in some places. I think Rich Fountain is the place where it has the highest fatality rate of anywhere in the Ozarks from drownings. That's because there's a cut bank there, and that cut bank actually has down, what do they call it? It's a uh, it's a downward pole, right? So undertow. <laughs> it has undertow. So right in cut banks, there's a tendency for the water to curl in and flow downward right there, right next to the cut bank. And so at Rich Fountain, there's a big cut bank there before the river heads east. And a lot of people drown there. In fact, when I was in, in high school, I went to Lynn, Missouri for high school for a short period of time. And from some of the surrounding places, there were drownings that would be. And of course, usually it involves alcohol of some sort as well. And somebody trying to swim across the river. And the Gasconade River is pretty big there. So you got to be kind of careful where you jump into a river. And of course, that's also going to be the place where a lot of the trees will topple in and you can get trapped under a tree. That's the most common way to drown in Ozark streams, I think. That's one of the more common ways. There's a lot of different ways you can drown in a stream. You could drown in three inches of water, okay? Um, so uh, I show that map of the Gasconade over here on the upper right-hand side. So it makes a right-hand bend. So it's a very vigorous down toe right there in that bend like that. That's very close to the little town of, of Rich Fountain. So I like to make the analogy for streams and that tendency to have this hel helical flow like that. It's a lot like NASCAR. You know, NASCAR has the tendency to bank the turns. And so your car is actually going on a 45 degree angle sideways. And they do that to kind of flatten the curve out for you. So you don't, you know, so you don't spin out or run into the wall, right? And so because of that, well, in a river, the only banks you get are the river banks and the cut banks. And so instead of being able to like make that bend very easily, your car, in fact, is going to roll. And that's what the water does when it, when it does that, when it hits the cut bank over there. It has this sort of what we call helical flow. So don't jump into rivers at cut banks. It could save your life sometime, okay? And keep all your friends from doing that sort of activity as well, okay? So make sure you got an entry and an exit point that's safe, okay? Um, so that is... I'm just being the, you know, the, the, the cautious uncle here for you, but you know, we like people to be safe. When we finally get to old age streams, you can get the cutoffs and you can get the oxbow lakes. Don't want to go into a lot of detail because you know, the, you already know that the, the gradient is low, the discharge is high, it's relatively flat, and you have the highest volume, right? So that's the discharge, right? And so eventually that stream is going to make it into a delta setting. And deltas are kind of wild. And the Mississippi River is a good example of that. The Mississippi River is actually a, a type of delta. And I know too much about sedimentation, okay? But I'm going to tell you anyway. It's a sediment-dominated delta because the wave activity that's in the Gulf of Mexico is nothing practically except during hurricanes, okay? So hurricanes have a tendency to come in and really move a lot of sediment around. But when there are no hurricanes there, the every day-to-day, -day, you know, activity, the waves may only be a foot or two high in the Gulf of Mexico. The Mississippi River Delta builds out this huge plume of sediment, and it makes a huge delta. And so that delta has a tendency to split into smaller and smaller channels. So just the opposite of what's happening in the headward regions in a delta, it will actually make what they call distributaries. And so distributaries are where the tributaries actually go the opposite way. They actually split off of the main channel and run out to the sea over here or over there. 
it's a lot like a fan in a way. And so deltas have that same capacity to have their sediment deposited. They have a tendency to try to create new deltas through time. Now, they've tried to stabilize the Mississippi River Delta from 150, 200, 300 years ago. But there is a natural tendency for the Mississippi River Delta to want to cut off the delta that has formed there. That delta is really too long for that river. It, it wasn't always that uh, it was 100 miles upstream to get to New Orleans. Um, here's an, an example of a delta here. This is a more classic sort of shape of a delta here. And in fact, you can just see the sediment spread across in a fan sort of shape. It looks a lot like an alluvial fan. And you can see the main channel running through here. But there's one distributary that runs off on one side of that delta. Now, this is a delta that formed at the mouth of a river that flows into a lake. This is up in Alaska. You can tell by all the... the uh, spruce trees and pine trees and firs and everything like that. But in fact, this is a much more common delta for us anyway. It's one of the few deltas that we have in the United States that is just obvious. And so this is called a bird's fit delta. In fact, it's a sediment dominated delta. And it's a delta where all that sediment has been distributed through time. The biggest passage down here on the lower part is called Main Pass. And so, but you can trace that up, and that's where most of the river traffic, you know, the barges and the and the main ships that come up to the, uh, there's a lot of petrochemical industries on the delta here. So they take those big tankers and so forth up that river uh, to places where they have tank farms. And But you can see the distributaries on here as well. So there's the, the smaller channels are all the distributaries. And if, they call it a bird's foot delta, obviously, because of the of the way that those distributaries look like a bird's foot, essentially. And so that's uh, that's about 100 miles south of of the uh, of New Orleans. OK, um, if you take the classic delta here, this is the Nile Delta. It's the most common delta. Uh, if you look at it, it's the opposite of the letter delta. So there's like one line running into a sort of like loop area or a place where there's a lot of sediment that's being deposited there. Uh, that's in the Mediterranean Sea to the north. Okay, so the, the Nile River runs through a desert from from deepest Africa in the in the uh, I think it's Lake Victoria is the source of the Nile. There's the Blue Nile, which is in Ethiopia. And then the the other uh, branch of the Nile, the White Nile, I think it is, flows from uh, from Lake Victoria, and they come together. And I think it's in uh, it's in um, the country that's just south of Egypt. There, it's uh, it's not Chad. It's uh, and it's not it's before it's before you get to Ethiopia. So it's Sudan. It's in the Sudan, and um, and so this river flows into. The Mediterranean Sea here. It's very fertile, or at least historically, it's been very fertile land. Today, they built a dam on the Nile River. It's called the Aswan High Dam, and so the Aswan High Dam actually locks up a lot of the sediment. And so that that that's one of the issues with impoundments is they tend to have a lot of siltation going on. What it does, it stops the sediment in its tracks, and the the sediment can't make it out of that impoundment then. And so there's a depletion in the soils down in the delta. And, of course, the wave activity in the Mediterranean is much higher than the Gulf of Mexico. So it has a tendency to smear out all of the sediments that do make it down to the coastline there. And so that is a classic delta, in fact. So that's the Nile Delta. Cairo is uh, about two-thirds of the way down in that delta. And Thebes and some of the more historic aspects of the ancient Egyptian civilizations, ancient civilizations that inhabited this area. Um, just, it's an amazing, wonder, wondrous place here. Uh, so that's the Nile Delta. It is a wave-dominated delta, just to compare it to the uh, the Mississippi River. And it has much more flow, in fact. So it has a much, it's a much larger river than the Mississippi even. Um, when we look at at the patterns that rivers form, we often call those drainage patterns. And so this is an example of a radial drainage pattern. The radial means that it's like on the spokes on a wheel. And so they flow away from a central uplifted area. In this case, it's a volcano. There is a tendency for some of the water to maybe collect on the inside of that volcano and flow out that little gap down here at the bottom. That would be called an annular drainage when it's circular. 
But in fact, when it goes and flows away from the high spot around that ridge that, that defines the crater there, that is a radial drainage pattern there. Um, we learn a little bit about geology from the drainage patterns. So here's, an, here's a few more of the drainage patterns that are very common. Dendritic, obviously. That's the most common form we have in the Ozarks as well, uh, in Missouri in general. Uh, you can see the radial drainage pattern over here away from a volcano uh, in uh, and you can actually see the streams flowing away from the high spot. You know, water flows downhill. So if you're to do a cross section through it, it's easy to see. It's got the ideal stream profile. Um, the one that's the rectangular uh, sort of uh, drainage pattern down here, that's based on faulting and fractures that are in the surface there that cause the water to deviate and flow, flow in kind of a rectilinear, rectangular sort of version right there. So uh, it, did I say dendritic? I didn't mean dendritic, but this one's a rectangular flow right there. Uh, the next one over here on the right, lower right-hand side, that is what they call a trellis. It has sort of a grapevine. So if there's a trunk that may run across a whole series of mountain ranges, that means that that river was there before the mountain ranges actually rose up and the river cut down through those ridges as they were being <laughs> lifted up. People don't realize that, but that's very common in places like the northern Appalachians. For instance, in, in Pennsylvania, there's a lot of downcutting where that river has been around for millions of years. Not the same water, but it's been around for millions of, winter, uh, millions of years in that place and has cut through these ridges. And if you look up Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, that's one of the places where there's a huge water gap there. So these water gaps cut across in the trunk streams. But then all the side streams flow in the valleys from the sides here, and it looks something like a grapevine, if you will. And so that's called a trellis drainage pattern here. So you see dendritic, radial, and then a rectangular, and then a trellis drainage pattern here. Uh, annular being sort of round-shaped as well, another type of drainage pattern. So if we have drainage patterns, we also have drainage basins. Drainage basins are the areas that actually catch the water from rainfall events and so forth. There is a tendency when you get headward erosion for some streams to cut into other stream valleys and take the water from them and then shoot it down their own, you know, trunk stream at some point. That's a process called stream piracy. So stream piracy where you, you cut into another drainage and you capture the water there, just like a pirate ship on the open sea. You board another ship and you take their loot. You're taking the water from another drainage basin, stream piracy. So drainage basins are collections of tributaries and trunk streams. The trunk streams tend to be the main streams and the tributaries, of course, feed into them. In humid temperate climates, the density of perennial streams tends to be greater than that of an air region. That's only common sense, right? It doesn't rain as much in the desert. And it explains how drainage basins tend to flood and some of them don't. And it explains why we get flashy streams around here that are associated with flash floods because we're in a headward region here and most of the streams drain locally here. And so they can raise, uh, the water level can rise very, very precipitously around here. If I talked about different ways you can drown in the Ozarks, that's the second most common way right there. People drive into floodwaters and they don't realize the force that's behind that floodwater. Every square foot of flood water is about 2,000 pounds of exertion on a flat surface, okay? So even if it's a foot deep, right? If you have a foot deep of flood water and you drive into it, it's going to shift your car off of the road and it may flip it over. And you could drown that way. It happens all the time in the Ozarks. Shh, shh, shh. Go on. That's my cat, okay? <laughs> I'll try to keep her from interfering with this last lecture here, but not always easy to do. So... Um, yeah, if we go on here, I'm going to talk a little bit how about hydrology. So, I, you know, maybe I'll stop here and I'll make this a two part sort of uh, recording here. So uh, that's enough about streams for the time being. We're going to talk about hydrology next and how people do ca calculations on stream flow. Anyway, thanks for your attention for now. And I'll put this thing together and upload it just as soon as I can. Thanks.